minute and a half and we'll get started. You're the second person I've met in the council wearing service stars. Myself. I've noticed that. I don't know what's up with that. I have a bonus set. I just don't have them in my uniform because I, when I wash it, I put them back on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I cheated. I measured all mine out and put dots on my shirt that don't wash off. That is awesome. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that was like yep, totally a pro hack. <laughs> I, I wear my, my uh, yeah. desert star, but I, I always get to get them back on. Well, I, about the third time I had to measure them, I'm like, nah, I'm done with this. <laughs> <laughs> that idea. Well, at least you have them consolidated. A lot of people will consolidate to a single blue star. Because you can add them all up and use the blue star as the cumulative. Number. Oh. But then it's like, oh, you only yeah, but, yeah, you so 19 you for blue? That's not very exciting. Yeah, because then you're not saying what you've actually done. It's like, this is my resume. This is yeah. the experiences I've had. This is my time. Yeah. So, when I talk about what it was like in Scouts, I know. See? I've got him. <laughs> so I'm Andrew Grantham, K6LR. I am an owl from last year's June course, and this is part of my ticket that is presenting this class on radio scouting. There we go. Uh, first of all, introductions. I've introduced myself. Go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. I am Jonathan Platt. I'm a bear. Owls are friends, not good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, W6106152. Uh, we'll look at my course. Um, Josh from Middleton, Idaho, um, is Scoutmaster, also on the Cub Committee, and just looking at what we can get our boys doing because they're getting rather bored and antsy as young boys do. Absolutely. Awesome. I'm Ken Anderson. I'm the Cub Master for Pack 22 and for Pack 10. I'm the Committee Chair for Pack 55. <laughs> And I'm the uh, religious evidence coordinator for the Oregon Trail District. And I'm just interested in finding out what event, what scouting, because as I came up through scouting, radio was nothing. Right. Okay. So when I saw this, I'm like, oh, I'm doing that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so what do you guys want to learn? Everything. Okay. I, I can go as in detail as possible, or I can give you a brief overview and have you out here in 15 minutes. Let's start with an overview, and then, and then we can go into detail. Okay. I own a ham radio unit that is just gathering dust, and I should probably Most of them do, do something with that. Okay. But, and I know there's an exam I have to pass in order to use it legally. We'll talk about that. I, yeah. Okay. How, to, how to pass such a thing would be... If you're not licensed, then you definitely are not licensed because you are to be Okay. okay. I'm interested. You're the target for I've audience been, for I've been course. interested for a long time. In fact, I used to work for the uh, for the county, for the sheriff's office in specific. Mm -hmm. I was I worked for the sheriff's office where we put all the MDTs in the emergency service vehicles. And as part of that, I gave a presentation to one of the local ham radio clubs. And I got so interested in ham radio at that point. And I've done nothing with it since. So I, I'm interested. Awesome. We're recording. Do you mind? I already asked Jonathan. So <laughs> my ticket counselor decided to move to Utah. So oh, nice. we're just proving that we had this course. Yeah. My uh, eight dollar clicker. There we go. Yeah. Thanks, Amazon. So with STEM, the next step is STEAM. So science, technology, engineering, and math. You add the A is arts and design. So with the science of RF, which is radio frequency, which is how it works, the technology of these neat little digital transceivers that I can use to talk around the world. Engineering, got some drawings up there. How to build a tower, how to get everything in place. The math, how tall does that tower need to be? When I build an antenna, what are the dimensions of it supposed to be? Arts and design. Okay, I just talked to someone that doesn't speak English. How did I talk to them? I'm talking to people around the world that speak different languages. It expands beyond just what we focus on for STEM. Um, and it has, it, it's a gateway into so many different things. So an amateur radio operator, they have a code as well. It's considered loyal, progressive, friendly, balanced, and patriotic. It sounds very similar to something that we live by 
day to day. Oddly enough, these two were written about three years apart. Interesting. So it's not much of a jump to go from amateur radio operator to ham, same thing, to scout and vice versa. What, yes. is, that, what is meant by progressive? <coughs> Staying up with technology. Okay. Not being stuck in our old ways. I'm a pack that's bringing on girls in the fall. That's one of those things that we're being progressive, we're adapting to current culture and doing something that we should have done a long time ago. Because um, the values that we present to youth are not gender specific. But that's not this class, that starts in, that, in an hour. <laughs> um, friendly, friendly is, is uh, ties in there, considerate, courteous are the same. Um, patriotic is a big one. Uh, ham radio operators present the uh, opportunity to provide immense amounts of service to their community, especially for emergency communications. You're familiar with that if you put in MDTs into cop cars. Um, when all that stuff goes down, we always hope that it never does. And Motorola or whoever your vendor says, oh no, 99.999% uptime. <laughs> When it goes down, your telephone lines go down, you're out of power, you've got a ham that's around the corner that's got the gear that's gonna show up to your dispatch center and say, okay, who do you wanna to talk to? Scout training continuum. If you've ran into Jeff Wixon or been to Wood Badge, you're probably relatively familiar with this. Um, we'll go through it quickly because you've been to Philmont. Initial rank, so Bobcat or Tenderfoot or Scout rather. Uh, on the adult side, youth protection, fast start's not something that we do anymore. Um, next step, youth position trained. So, like patrol leader, assistant patrol leader, uh, SPL, what have you. We'll get you to leader specific training, like today in the morning, blue owls, which is gonna be the same thing next year in IOLS. Advanced training, NYLT for the youth, wood badge for everyone else. Get you to, uh, the National Advanced Training in Philmont, which you've been to. Have you been yet? To Philmont? Yeah. I've never been to Philmont. I almost made it there one year and then moved. It's on your bucket list. Start planning. Philmont's a great place. Experience of a lifetime. I'm not sure it's, it's what I need to do yet. I haven't been convinced that one yet, but we'll see that one <laughs> another time. You can just go on one of the hikes. You know, but we go on hikes to get here. It's fun. You'll probably, have you sat down with Dirk at all? I don't know Dirk. Okay. He's a council with their uh, Bill Mon ambassador. That guy will talk you into amazing things. I have not met him yet. Maybe that's why I haven't been convinced yet. <laughs> the, the training side is, is incredible also. I mean, the stuff they offer for training is incredible. But the, the adventure side, the boys can go do it, the leaders can go do it, the boys, the, the hikes are just incredible. And I was uh, in Houston and the uh, company I worked for had a philanthropic arm that every 20 hours they donate $500 to the troop. And so we paid for our travel completely out of that. And I, I was set to attend, but then we moved here. <laughs> <laughs> so we got continuing education. This is obviously one of those university scouting round table, powwow, scout university, which I hope they improve because it's a big turnoff. Safety courses like severe weather. That transitions to the radio scouting continuum. Introduction, so jamboree on the air is huge. That's in October, that's when we introduce for the first time for a lot of scouts what ham radio is. We also get unit radio use in there, which I'll talk about a little bit later. The next step, rank advancement, very similar to what we have with training. The radio merit badge on the Boy Scout side, amateur radio licensing for anyone. There is no age limitation on amateur radio license. Once you get your license, it's a lifetime license. So there are four-year-olds that have amateur radio licenses. They're not four anymore, they're a little bit older, but they've advanced. Special recognition, the Morse code interpreter strip, I'll show you a picture of the amateur radio operator strip. Looks like this is amateur radio operator. It's one on the sleeve, not a pocket. It's a BSA? You can wear it on either location. Okay. And it's a BSA patch, and it's a rating strip. Um, very similar to the uh, radio operator, uh, what was it, airman strip for the Air Scouts. It's, it's from that heritage that, that it's crossed over. <coughs> so Jamboree on the Air, largest scouting event in the world. 1.6 million scouts participate in it. Uh, if you tie that in with Jamboree on the internet, which is the secondary component of it, that's just started about five years ago, that number is closer to two million. 
that eclipses World Jamboree, every National Jamboree, every major scouting camp combined for a year is still eclipsed by this by 10%. Wow. This is where scouts talk to other scouts all over the world. Um, it is the third weekend of October each year. And it runs from Saturday morning to Sunday morning. I will send you my slide deck if you put your email address on here. I'll send it to you. It has these notes in it. Um, there's jump time. Jump time is something that we do amongst amateur radio operators. If there's a contest, there's jump time six hours before it starts, and it's basically equipment test. Make sure that what you've set up is actually going to work so that the minute the contest starts, the minute Jamboree on the air starts, you can start making contacts. Um, amateur radio operators will come to you. Camp Reed, council camp, a park, your church, wherever you guys are meeting at. Um, they, they like to make it uh, for large events because it is quite a bit of equipment they have to set up usually. Um, and it depends because we talk about high frequency, which is the lower bands, it's 3 to 30 megahertz. It's down kind of where CB is at, CB radios. So it's really long distance, doesn't require any repeaters or anything in between. Those require relatively large antennas. Uh, you get up into UHF, uh, an antenna this size is sufficient. Actually, wrong radio. That size is sufficient. Um, this is a digital mobile radio. These are tied to the internet. So it goes from here across the radio to a repeater, and the repeater's tied to the internet. I can talk from here to around the world. And that's just locally to a, to a transceiver somewhere here, and then it goes over the internet to another tower where it broadcasts out on mm -hmm. radio again. So in that particular system, I'll talk about that a little bit further um, later on. It's connected to one that's up by Bogus Basin, and it's tied to about 4,000 other sites across the world. So what's the um, air range on one of those UHF? We'll talk about that a little bit further too, but we'll do it right now because you mentioned it. Um, VHF and UHF, which are your typical walkie-talkie frequencies, it's a mile per watt and it's line of sight. So if you can draw a laser pointer and see the laser pointer on the other end, you've got good coverage. If you're going through foliage, going around hills, over valleys, it's not going to get you the coverage that you're looking for. That That's where you end up with repeater towers that are, and they can be large or small. I, pull a pair of them up to Willow Creek. Either of you been to Willow Creek? That's not, not a good Willow Creek. Either, <laughs> it's a scout camp in April up near Emmett on the west side of Squaw View. I will send you guys information about Willow Creek as well. Um, is that a location or is that an event? That's an event okay. at Willow Creek, which is on Van Dusen Road. Technically, it's a big flat road by the time you get that far north, about 14 miles north of Emmett. It's a big scout competition. Um, we're opening it up to try and get more people to scouts up there to get exposure to it. But Boy Scouts and Ventures compete like crazy, and go through stations like Fire Building and First Aid and Obstacle Course, Scout Knowledge, Flag Etiquette. There's a demonstration area, including ham radio, oddly enough. Um, there's nine stations plus some land nav that they have to do in order to get to the station in the correct order. You all give a score and then we give out a bunch of little awards. Is this similar to a Klondike and it's got skills? Very similar to that. Okay. Um, so with Joda, with Jamboree on the air, you can either do uh, repeater contacts, so like within the valley, and we've had that a number of times, um, where you'll have ham radio operators that are basically at home and they can contact to wherever you've got your ham with your troop or your pack. Um, and make contacts that way. You can do HF where you're talking around the world um, with just a piece of wire. Um, you can do Echolink, which is again, it's kind of a radio onto the internet, onto the radio on the other end. Um, you can do geofoxing, which is a combination of geocaching and fox hunting or, or transmitter hunting, um, where you use a GPS unit and you can tie that to um, a receiver and an antenna and try to find where the hidden transmitter is at. You do that over big areas. Um, you can do a construction project. You can build um, an antenna like this one here that kind of looks like a TV antenna. You can build that out of a tape measure. Um, so you've got a construction project. It's a good gathering activity. Um, you can earn the Radio Merit Badge. Radio Merit Badge, there's three different tracks that you can take, and I'll hit that a little bit later, but you can do that within Joda pretty easily. Um, let's get through my notes here. You don't have to do Joda just in October. You can set this up 
whenever you want to because there's always hands on the air. Um, if you have a point where STEM makes sense in your program, say in April, or say as a gathering activity at Blue Gold, um, get all the amateur radio operators in your area and they'll help you out. Um, 1.3 million scouts, 29,000 ham radio operators, 12,000 stations, 150 countries. Is that all? That's all. <laughs> and growing. Um, it's, uh, again, the largest scouting event they've got in the world. Um, <coughs> quick reference card. So this is a, a card that I'll email out to you. Um, that's great to give to the scouts because the worst thing that you can have happen is you get a tiger that says, okay, here, talk. And he doesn't say anything. And the other end doesn't know that it's a six-year-old boy that's, you know, frightened from here next week. So we give them a reference card. We give them some basic information and some questions so that they actually are not getting that deer in the headlights look. So name city, that's you, the scout. Today's call sign, so in my case, it'd be K6LOR, the phonetics, Kilo 6, Lima, Oscar, Romeo. If we want to use more phonetics, here's the list right there. There's some shorthand codes that we use in scout or in uh, ham radio. So like QTH is what is your position or what, what's your home. CQ is your calling, so like CQ, CQ, CQ. That makes the other stations know that you're trying to call and make a contact. Uh, 73 is best regards, that's kind of an aloha or goodbye. And then... 45 different questions. What's your favorite color? What are you guys doing this afternoon? What's your favorite football team? It's kind of icebreakers to get them to start talking. Um, these are super easy. They take up half a sheet of paper. They're much easier to read once they're actually printed out, just not up on the screen. Um, but it's a great way to get that conversation going. So contact local amateur radio operators well in advance. I uh, can put you guys in touch with wherever it's uh, Hoot Gibson in Middleton. I know for sure he lives out in Purple Sage. And I can find someone that's relatively close to you. Um, the LDS Church has an insane number of amateur radio operators. It's a point of emphasis for them for emergency communications, emergency preparedness. Some of them better things than others. Yeah. So there's that. Um, try to make sure you have a balanced Joda program. So it's great that they show up and they get on the radio and then now what do they do? So have some activities that they can do, antenna building, there's construction, um, box hunting, different things like that. Make sure that you appreciate your ham radio operators because this is a good example of most of the old guys that do amateur radio rock are really old. And they're more than happy to come out. Um, one thing that I will throw out there, they may not be the best at communicators especially with you. So take that into account, don't overwhelm. Um, this is kind of an ideal station. So you've got a radio operator in the center, no more than about five scouts, flanking total. Hi. Um, anything more than about five, so basically about the size of a patrol and it becomes very overwhelming for them. Uh, Jeffrey on the air is a scout event, so scout rules apply. Scout leaders are in charge. Youth protection policies apply. Um, if things get out of hand, you as the scout leaders are the ones that step in. Um, generally, it's not a problem. Usually, they're enthused by technology. Um, There's something other than a cell phone. Cell phone is a radio. It's a radio transceiver, um, specifically a digital one that has uh, all kinds of different interfaces, computer and radio, basically. Introduction unit radio use. This is one of the ways that the rest of the year that you're not at Joda, that you can be implementing ham radio into your program to get them the exposure to it. Uh, parade coordination, we use this in Middleton to coordinate between our staging area and our gathering area because there's not enough room at the parade staging area for all of our parents to drop off kids. So we have them in one area and we're ready to go back and forth coordinate, okay, how many boys are coming in this group? How many are leaving in that group? Where's so-and-so's mom? Uh, bad picture example. You are not allowed to wear gloves on honor guard. It's a military thing. Same reason we can't wear camera. But it's a great picture you want. Disregard that minor infraction. Backpacking. Uh, I was on a 60 miler. It was 50 miles, and then they forgot that we had to walk the rest of the way to the scout camp. 
So it's a 60 mile hike. Um, I was a slow guy. I've always been a slow hiker. Uh, my best friend Dan Newman, uh, he, he's the one that got me into radio. He was kind of our radio point guy within our unit. Um, he was a fast hiker. So he was at the front, I was at the back. We had radio communications between each other and we all stayed together for the first three and a half days. Late on the afternoon of day three, my radio battery died. About an hour later, his died as well. Um, so we camped that night and started out day four. Day four, I had a second wind. I thought that I could take on the world. So I happened to be at the front, along with Dan. No radio communication at that point. And we somehow got separated. So the front half group ended up at day six's campsite. We put down 23 miles that day. The other half of our troop stayed at night four and night five, and we finally saw them on night six. There's certain things that if you don't have enough batteries, that's gonna be a problem. We learned that on that trip. But being able to coordinate, especially on shorter weekend trips, keeping your groups together, it works great. Scouting for food, we use it in Middleton to coordinate between vehicles for what streets we've gone down so that we're not on cell phones. Last thing we want to do is see someone with a cell phone up to their head. Please stop using your cell phone while driving. Day camp, uh, Centennial District uses the heck out of FRS radios, which are license-free blister pack radios, which I will yell about later. Uh, the Radio Merit Badge. So there's three different tracks. You can either do broadcast, you can do shortwave listening, or you can do amateur radio in order to earn the radio merit badge. Um, you can do it on kind of a day-long workshop pretty easily. Uh, the shortwave listening and broadcast tracks take about a week of additional work. Uh, the amateur radio track takes four hours of listening, which you can knock out during Jamboree on the air pretty easily. Um, is that a question? Yeah. Sure. I'm assuming that the course code in that merit badge is BSA? Uh, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. I hadn't even noticed that. I thought that was just a... Great catch. The reflection on the glass. I've been doing this uh, 22 years. That's the first time I've noticed. So thank you. And the uh, programming that merit badge also has BSA and binary. Does it really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So um, there are two different types of merit badges that teenage boys like. Easy ones and ones for evil. This is an easy one. Boys jump all over it. Um, I dropped in at the Milton Merit Badge Clinic. The gentleman that was teaching the radio merit badge, it was standing room only. Wow. So, no, it wasn't a very big room either. It was, it was a tiny room. It was people at max. So here's a trend, 18,000 drops down to 9,000. Right around 1985, they removed the Morse code requirement. You used to have to know Morse code in order to be able to earn the merit badge. They also added on the shortwave listing and broadcast uh, tracks. So you didn't just have to do amateur radio. It's been steadily going up. Last year, it was somewhere around 78,000 is what 2017 closed out at. So it's, it's pretty high as far as the number of merit badges that are, that are earned um, with radio. Any guesses on who this guy is? Samuel Morse. He is. That's awesome. Do you need to know Morse code in order to get an amateur radio license? I don't know. You no longer have to. Yes. Um, Morse code is a helpful, it's at CW or continuous wave is the name of the mode. Um, very helpful when you're in really bad band conditions, when it's very noisy. That if there's solar storms, that's a great time that only Morse code will work. The other 95% of the time, this stuff works just great, regular voice. Um, digital modes are actually getting really good for working with weak signals. Um, so you don't need that. Hamexam.org is an online test uh, practice website that you can go through practice exams. The basic uh, license class is called Technician. It's 35 questions. It's taken from a question pool of 550 questions. Those 35 questions are asked differently, but the answers are in the same order. It's all multiple choice. The 
key with getting on the amateur radio is listening to existing amateur radio operators. So get a radio and start listening. Get your license and then the other 90% is once you're actually licensed. Um, like I said, four-year-olds have mastered this exam. It's not super difficult. It talks primarily about what frequencies you're allowed to use, which most radios will only allow you on those frequencies, and what not to say. So you can't do music. You can't use foul language. You can't broadcast to yourself because um, there's different classes for that. Uh, Sirius XM would be a good one for swearing, and the FM service would be what you would normally use for broadcasting just to other people. One-way communication. What do you mean that you can't broadcast to yourself? You have to have two-way communication. So you have to be talking to someone or something else. So leaving a voicemail, someone else is going to listen to it. That's one thing. But just setting up your radio station and playing the music that you want to hear while you're out and about, not allowed. Gotcha. There's other radio services for that. So hamexam.org, go on there. It takes probably, I'd say probably a week to go through there, 20, 30 minutes a day, to go through the exams and get a feel for what the basic operating principles are. Uh, you can also buy a book, you can do a CD, you can watch videos. Uh, you're still going to the same exam. Um, once you've completed to the point where you're getting good passing scores, 90% or better, uh, you can go to Food to Store, which is in Meridian, First Saturday of the month, fifteen dollars to take your test in person. It's through volunteer examiners. So there are other ham radio operators who have higher class licenses that the FCC recognizes are suitable to uh, give the exam out. Fifteen bucks covers their costs. It's not going to the FCC. Nobody's making a profit on it. It's the expense of all the testing material. Um, once you do that, it's a lifetime license. You never have to pay again unless you want to upgrade licenses, and I encourage you to do so. There's a couple more classes. They just give you more frequencies to operate on. Are there RCA stores also um, when the exams are now that? Possibly. Possibly. Um, there's, uh, I know at the state convention, the Ham Radio State Convention is the fourth weekend in April, I believe. Um, that's out towards the airport or the conference center. They usually run a licensing exam on Saturday. So um, it used to be that it was at Radio Shack stores and it'd be like every month or every other month. But since the LDS Church put such an emphasis on getting amateur radio licenses in every state and now every ward, um, they, the demand is just really pushed it up. So it's every first Saturday. Um, talks primarily about STEM topics and, and rules for the license. It's pretty much it. It's a very easy license. You will learn 90% more once you get on the air, as opposed to what you learn in order to get the license taken care of. Uh, I have taught what's called a ham cram, and it's a about a four-hour class that goes through everything, and then you immediately take the test. I've taught that to fifth graders, and had about 80% of them pass. So it's not super deep material, it's just kind of giving them the feel for what not to do. And a lot of it's the way the questions are written. It's like, okay, well the first three answers are there's no way it could be that, and these two maybe, and then you just try to choose your best answer between those. Special recognition. So the amateur radio operator rating strip, which you can either wear on the right above the uh, quality unit, which I need to buy, um, or above the Boy Scouts of America. Um, I'm not sure what the order is on those between interpreter strips and like the legal trace, trace trainer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whoever sews on, hopefully we'll know. Um, the other one is the Morse code interpreter strip, which again is above Boy Scouts of America. Um, that one you have to know five words per minute, and that is at the unit level. So your unit will determine whether a person qualifies for it. I do not speak Morse. It's not my thing. I have tried and it, I just can't get it. So, um, but I know a lot of people that do, especially the old timers, but especially in military service, uh, where it was, you had to know it. Um, so there were 6,800 of the amateur radio operator strips sold the first year. Um, 
about 1,200 of the Morse code strips sold last year. Middleton, there are 62 hams and 1,800 homes. It's one in every 29 homes. Within the one by two mile grid of Capitol High School, there's 190. There are hams everywhere. And a lot of that has to do with either technology because it's in their field, they got them into the field that they work in, or um, emergency preparedness. A lot of it is emergency preparedness. The preppers are killing me right now. They are uh, overly ambitious and they've taken over the ways. So, yeah, it's good to be prepared. There's one, yeah, I was gonna say, there's one thing about being prepared, being a prepper, it's just... It's just another crazy. step. I, I have a lot of respect for another scouter and he's full on prepper and I'm like, this is gonna kill my job. This is true, I don't even know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I want to step back from that even further. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the difference between red and blue dots there? Um, oh, it's male and female. Ah. Good question. I know I wrote down for some reason. Um, so why do they do it? Emergency preparedness, community service, preppers, uh, political issues in third world countries. There's a lot of amateur radio operators in places except for countries that don't allow it, like North Korea. Iran. Gee, I wonder why. And then there are even still some there. International goodwill. It's one of the, the tenets of amateur radio. And then STEM. You said there are 150 countries about that are using it. Mm -hmm. Do we know where the areas of the world are that they're not? Is this kind of an African thing that's not in there, or is it more predominantly used there? Is there an area of the world that's, because we're missing about this country? There's the four countries in the world that do not allow amateur radio at all. Okay. And they are. Your typical nuclear wielding uh, dictatorships. Yeah. Um, so North Korea, Iran, uh, Libya at one point, uh, and there's another one in Africa. But pretty much every other country in the world has some form of amateur radio. Okay. Um, a lot of the technologies that we take for granted now were pioneered in amateur radio and then commercialized. Um, text messaging is a great example. Text messaging started out as packet radio, which is um, basically a, a single line data transmission. Um, it's very slow, but it doesn't need to be very fast because all you're sending is text. Um, we used packet field day when I was a Boy Scout. We were able to talk radio to radio about 150 miles. So that eventually worked into SMS and text messaging and then pictures from the next step. Uh, slow scan TV was pioneered with amateur radio. That's what a video message looks like now on your cell phone. Um, I can keep going on and on. It's a lot of the things that we have commercial applications for, we work out the bugs first with amateur radio. Mentoring next generation of hands, ICOM is a manufacturer of amateur radio equipment. They will, they have a great relationship with uh, BSA National Council. If you get a hold of them well enough in advance, you tell them who the amateur radio, out, amateur radio operator is, where you're at, and what the event is, they will send you a Pelican case, kind of like that one, full of amateur radio gear used for it. You gotta send it back when you're done, but they're, they're doing their best to try to, to get everybody um, access to the equipment. We talked about this one a little bit earlier. VHF, UHF, line of sight. So VHF, which is going to be one, well, it actually technically starts at 50 megahertz. Uh, 50 megahertz up to 300 megahertz. Um, firefighters are right in that same range. Uh, they use 160 megahertz. One mile, one watt. As long as you can see it, it'll work. Uh, UHF, that cuts down to about two thirds of a mile per watt. So it's a higher frequency, so it doesn't travel as far. Um, but still, you have to have line of sight. So then you get into repeater towers. So if you're out and about just on the flatland, no problem, direct radio to radio. When you start getting into the forest, those trees are going to be a heck of a time trying to get a radio signal through. Get up on the mountaintop, you can talk into the trees, you can talk out into the flat, no problem. You can't talk through the hill, all you can through a repeater tower. So when you're using VHF or UHF radios like these, you just have to bear that in mind when you're out and about you know, on your hike, 
don't lose line of sight. You don't want to get spread out a mile and a half long going down the trail with your scouts anyways because they're making a ton of noise as it is. That entire leave no trace thing, even minimal trace. So what's your budget? What do you plan on doing with your radio equipment? The gentleman that was in here in the morning session, he wanted to be able to talk to his family over in eastern Idaho after an EMP. Um, he might have been a prepper. Um, you need lower frequency gear in order to do that because it's not a line of sight. It'll go through the ionosphere and come back down. Or ground wave, which travels across the surface of the earth. Um, you need bigger antennas. So like a vertical antenna, it might be 25 feet tall. As compared to the VHF gear here, one of these antennas might only be 19 inches tall. So the higher the frequency, the shorter the antenna. Scout is thrifty. This HF radio, one of those ones that will go around the world, $12,499. The top of the line model. Um, free shipping and first 150 customers, you can find 150 customers to buy it, you get a custom map for your ham shack. Ham shack is basically the man cave where you put all your radio stuff. You can buy a car for cheaper. You can buy a car for 12 grand. So, you know, $12,499. Obviously, special order. We don't keep those in stock. Is it possible to be too thrifty? This little radio is thirteen dollars and fifty cents. You can buy one for every scout in your unit. You can buy two. You can buy three and have a spare. They're going to lose one anyways. <laughs> Pack of twenty, hundred ninety dollars and eighty-six cents. Heck of a deal. Thanks, Amazon. So blister pack radios, these are the ones that come, your G, uh, GMRS or G, uh, FRS radios, these are like the ones the district uses at day camp, up to 35 miles. But remember, a mile a watt, these are UHF, so a little less, and these only do two watts. But it's great marketing information. Oh, but mine does 35 miles. But not through foliage, not through the canyons. So perhaps on a clear day, from peak to peak, with the stars aligned, you might be able to do it. This is the uh, typical cheap entry level ham radio. Uh, it's a VHF UHF radio, it's a dual band. Uh, complete radio, $26. How much popcorn do you have to sell to buy one? about two boxes. Now, now the better question is, why are we making so much money off popcorn? Why is popcorn so expensive? Don't dwell on that. It'll make your head hurt. If you're going to lose a black radio, get a yellow one. They also have orange, green, blue, camouflage. It's all the same electronics on the inside. Uh, we're up to $32. Okay. Three boxes of popcorn. But then you have to accessorize. So you'll need a longer antenna. This one's 14 inches long. I've got some that are about that. Uh, you'll want to put it in a case because you don't want them to lose it. You'll probably want an earpiece so that they're not pulling it out of the case. You can even bedazzle it if you want to. <laughs> Let's do vehicle communications. If you put this radio in your hand and you're talking to someone else with a radio in their hand inside their metal and glass automobile, how far away are you going to be able to talk to each other? The same that's going to be true with line of sight. Uh-huh. Most vehicles, most newer vehicles have passive aided glass. That's true. Which is basically, you've created a Faraday cage and it's not to protect you. It's because your vehicle generates so much RF interference to everything else in the world that they're required to capture all of that RF and keep it on the inside of the car so it doesn't interfere with police, with trains, with aircraft, with GPS, rather than fix their problems within their vehicle, we're just going to contain it. This radio right here, pretty straightforward, small enough, you can put it right on the passenger seat, 45 watts. Line of sight, still, you're 15 to 20 miles pretty easily. You have to install an external antenna on the car. We're talking about antennas. Hey. That's convenient. So, you can drill a hole. All the old timers, all you got to drill a hole. 
three quarter inch and above out. Right through the roof. Gotta be in the center of the roof. You can put a mag mount right next to it and it's only 0 0.02 dB difference. Bearing in mind 3 dB is half of our power. So 0 0.02, well, that's negligible. I'll take that. Well, let's put that mag mount on the corner of the hood. Well, that's 2.4 dB of your power. So we've lost nearly half our power just by moving it from the roof to the fender. Oh, but let's get an on glass mount, kind of like a cell phone antenna, one that sticks right onto the back glass. Well, at the very top, we're half a dB. Eh, middle, we're at 1.2. That's not great. Three, we've lost half our power just based on moving it up and down four inches. Well, let's keep an eye on those magnets. It's an iron magnet. They're temporary. Put it on there. Use it. When you're done with your outing, take it off. Throw it in the trunk. Throw it back in the garage. Better yet, make sure that you wipe the surface clean. Make sure that it's not wet. Most newer vehicles, fiberglass or aluminum, my work F-150 is an all aluminum body. Magnet, magnet's not going to stick to it. it Slide right off. It laughs at you and says, no, no, it's not going to happen. So we'll talk about STEM careers and we are coming close to the tail end of our time. Uh, public Safety Research Defense, Telecom. I work in Telecom. I've worked in Telecom since high school. Matter of fact, in high school. Um, so what I do now is direct re directly related to being a ham radio operator and exposure to as a Boy Scout. Uh, Dan Newman, the lead hiker on our 60 miler, he's an electrical engineer. He's in that field working for GE Healthcare directly related to being an amateur radio op operator. Uh, he got his EE at Chico State. It took him five years instead of four. So, yes, STEM careers are a good thing. Just make sure you don't go to a party school. <laughs> IT and security, uh, the inventors, makers, and builders is huge. Um, there was astronauts, presidents, electrical engineers. Uh, the King of Jordan was an amateur radio operator. Um, there's 780,000 amateur radio operators in the U.S. this year, and that number continues to climb. Um, and a lot of it has to do with it's big for STEM. The basics that you get with uh, amateur radio, it just it continues on. It evolves into you know, so much more. Questions? The questions part. There's Dan Newman. We're at field day. This is 1996. Here I am with my stylish grandfather's uh, duck hunting jacket. Uh, on packet, we were actually communicating with another station that was about 90 miles away. Thanks for your time, guys. Thank you. Grab a cookie. Turn that off.